Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, just as a quick note, if you need to ask questions during the webinar, if you have technical issues, uh, feel free to address those directly to your host, Michael Sisson. Um, you can type them in the chat window below this presentation deck or just direct them via a private chat with me directly and I'll be happy to help you out with that. Uh, but otherwise, let's get started, and I'd like to introduce you to Christopher Tremblay, your moderator for the day. Thanks, Michael. Hello, and welcome to this ACRA webinar about the Strategic Enrollment Management Endorsement Program, known as SEMEP. As Michael mentioned, my name is Christopher Tremblay, and I serve as the director of SEMEP, and today I'm the moderator of this webinar. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to be featuring SEMEP graduate Stephen McDowell, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, today's webinar will begin with uh, Stephen describing his experience as a learner, and then I will follow that up with information about the program, curriculum, logistics, admission, et cetera. For questions, please use the chat functionality um, to pose your questions, and we'll answer questions at the end of both of our sections. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the recording following the webinar for future reference. So let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen McDowell, who is a 2017 graduate of SEMEP. He is the Director of Financial Aid Services and Guided Pathways Recruitment Manager for the Connecticut State Colleges and University System. In addition to his various other association memberships, he's the president of the Connecticut Association of Professional Financial Aid Administrators, and he's also an evaluator for ACROS SEMEP. Steve holds a bachelor's degree in finance from Bentley University and an MBA from the University of Hartford. So welcome, Stephen, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Thanks, Christopher. And you know, as, as you went through and wrote my title, I'm, I'm kind of thinking I'm glad I don't have an acronym because I don't think it would quite fit anywhere. Um, so what I'd like to do is take you through a little bit of the background of my story and how I, how I landed where I am. So back in the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, uh, from where I am now at the Connecticut State Colleges and University System, I was promoted from Assistant Director of Financial Aid Services to Director. Uh, and in talking with one of my supervisors, we got into the discussion of kind of where do you want to go in your career? And, and he had mentioned to me, well, had you ever thought about enrollment management? And it was, well, you know, no, I hadn't. And after talking with him, he, he more or less pointed me in the direction of ACRO and said, well, why don't you check out this organization? It looks like they have a program that you might be interested in and, and go from there. So. So I had applied to the program and was accepted at the end of June in 2016. And it was more or less this welcome back to college feeling of, man, I haven't done this in a while, and, and how am I going to balance this with work and family and everything. But it was, it was really a nice benefit to have the program be very self-paced. Um, so how I had started, and I know Christopher will go over the, the program specifics in a little more detail, um, but I had gone through and, and done the webinars at, at a self pace to get a little bit acclimated and then went into the Essentials of SEM course uh, and then got into the site visits. Um, but what I want to talk about first is, is, you know, what I had learned from the program. And after being in financial aid for about 10 years at that point in my career, it was, well, well what else beyond financial aid? does higher education have because, you know, working in aid, you, you see that it touches a lot of parts, but you may not really understand how all those parts move. Uh, so, so I think going through this program really gave me a good hands-on solid foundation into all of the other areas that touch them, be, whether it be finance, admissions, registration, uh, IR, IT, really, really the whole gamut. Um, and as far as how am I benefiting from the program, uh, I. I, I tried to jot down a few things that that really would portray how this program has benefited me. Um, and the best way I can shore it up is to, to think of new ways of solving old program uh, old problems, excuse me. Um, so one thing we did with our community colleges is take a look at our satisfactory academic progress policy and financial aid. And, and it was very basic. 
So it was very simple when we found that, you know, students who had a really poor first semester um, were really disadvantaged right off the bat. So, you know, we sat and thought, well, how, how could we make this a little bit better? Um, so we brought in our provost in the system. We brought in our student success center executive director and had a really robust conversation and landed on, you know, we're going to take this um, satisfactory academic progress policy and really scale it to give students in the beginning a real shot who may have had a poor first semester. Um, and as a shameless plug, I'm doing a, a session on this at the NASA conference next, next week, if any of you happen to be going. Um, but, but it was really taking an all-inclusive look to student success uh, in, a, in a financial aid aspect and, and bringing it uh, to the forefront. And you know what we had found were, were really stifling results. I mean, just in the first semester alone, um, we had uh, an advising tool put into the policy, and we saw you know over 4,000 students across our colleges being advised. So that was something that wouldn't have normally happened. Um, and something that I probably wouldn't have normally had thought about um, previously. Uh, something else as a benefit to me was uh, now part of my title is a Guided Pathways Improvement Manager. Um, as many of you may be familiar with Guided Pathways, it is a movement that requires colleges to take an integrated um, institution-wide approach towards student success that's driven by evidence uh, and really focused on helping learners move from entry to attainment of their educational or employment goals. And you know, working heavily with community, college, community colleges, we've found that about two thirds of our population are part time. Um, so, how are we really servicing those students who are going part time to get to where they need to go? Um, I've made a lot of professional connections along the way, uh, which has been really beneficial. If you want to have a colleague to bounce things off of, if you if you start to think you're going crazy from work and and you need you know that sound advice from a colleague. Um, and then I think the thing I'm most proud of at this point actually became public today. Um, what I had done my capstone project on, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, is bringing enrollment management to our system in a formal capacity. Um, and, and our system president had announced today, and it will go to our board later in the week, um, that that is going to become a reality. So the, the best, what, uh, actually, Two of the better benefits of the program, one is field visits, and the second would be the capstone, in my opinion. Um, but the first for field visits, I had gone to Gateway Community College, which is the largest community college in the state of Connecticut, so it's about 12,000 students. Um, and truth be told, I had worked there for a couple of years, um, but it's been since about 2010, so it was nice to take a field trip back and see where the, where the college has been. And, and it was very nice to go back and work with old colleagues and go through and, and get each office's take on the same problem. And it was interesting because they all had the same problems, uh, which revolved around communication, ironically, um, that I had ended up being the sounding board for all these problems. And, and it was a good way to see that, you know, the areas of financial aid and admissions and, and registrar and, and finance were, were not really talking to each other. Um, and, and it was a good way to recap in the end to say, you know, hey guys, listen, you guys are all on the same board, but you're not in the same room talking. Um, so that was a good way, you know, to take an outsider's view into what was going on at that particular school. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, I had uh, taken a trip to New York City to the system office for CUNY, um, and that was a whole experience in itself, um, miles and miles in a positive direction. I had reached out to their now retired deputy dean of enrollment management and said, hey, listen, you know, I'm doing this program and uh, I need to visit a site and I'd really be interested in seeing what your system does, having working, been working in a system myself. Uh, and he had reached back to me and set up an entire day from about 10 to 4, meeting with uh, every office they had there from enrollment management to admissions to finance to marketing. And I think that visit was the best benefit I had as far as field visits goes. Uh, having working in a system and being able to see how another system functions. Uh, for my third field visit, what I had elected to do was take a conference session from the acro -SEM conference in 2016, uh, Improving Student Retention Research-Based Strategies for College Student Success, Parts 1 and 2, which was hosted by Dr. David Kalsbeek um, from DePaul and Jay Goff from St. Louis University, um, and gone ahead and um, prepared a writing off of that. 
So well, all in all, taking a, a, a 2020 visit in the background of field visits, it was really nice to go out uh, and see kind of how the other half lives, what other areas are doing, and you may find out that, hey, these people might have some of the same problems you do, and you can work together um, and collaborate to move forward. Uh, as far as my capstone, what I had done was taken an approach towards enrollment management within our 12 community colleges. Now, uh, as a little bit of a background, our state system is comprised of 12 community colleges, four state universities, and one online college. Uh, and in working primarily with our community colleges, uh, while we've centralized quite a bit of the financial aid aspect um, of our program, it's, uh, the approach to enrollment management isn't quite the same in that some schools do it and some schools don't. Um, some schools do it effectively and some schools kind of just call it a dressed up name for admissions. Um, so what this plan had done was taken an approach to gathering data, to forming an office, to really getting our 12 colleges uh, in a row to work together and do the same things, really with the student in mind at the end, um, making that student experience the same across, uh, across the board. And, you know, the first thing I did once I had gotten uh, Christopher to review my capstone and, and make some suggestions, uh, I had immediately passed it to our provost and chief of staff and said, you know, hey, listen, I know you folks knew I was going through this program. I just finished. Uh, I'd like you to take a look at this and see what you think. And, you know, they both said, yeah, you know, we'll look at it. And, and being a little bit persistent at times, saying, hey, don't forget, you know, I think we'd really benefit from this. And, and now about, I'd say, a year and a quarter later, we're, we're finally moving towards that. So I'm, I'm really proud that the, the homework and the research that I did is really going into something uh, that will benefit our system, in, in my opinion. And with that, I believe I'm going to turn it over to Christopher to talk a little bit more about the program. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stephen, for your insights. And hopefully for all of you, that gives you, um, you know, a look into one learner's experience. And again, Stephen will be still available for questions. I'm going to kind of go through the nuts and bolts of the program, uh, especially for those who might not be uh, as familiar with SEMI-P. Um, you know, as Stephen mentioned, it is a self-paced uh, program, and it's designed for people who are currently working in the field of enrollment management or enrollment services. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about what that means. You know, in terms of the mission of the program, it's really designed to produce, you know, competency and readiness. Um, and to develop expertise in the field of strategic enrollment management, um, and again, to deliver an approved uh, curriculum, and then finally, to provide a formal endorsement of a skill set. It's the only endorsement available currently in the field of enrollment management. There are certificate programs and master's degrees, but this is unique um, to our industry. Uh, we do have graduates uh, from 14 states and two Canadian provinces as of this past January, and you can see all of their states represented there. Um, we do also have some learners uh, in some international countries as well who are currently in the program. In terms of admission requirements, we do require at least five years of experience in the field of strategic enrollment management, and that can be in any of the areas, admissions, registrar of financial aid, institutional research and other affiliated areas like student success, depending on the person's career path. But we want people who have a basic understanding of how these areas work. Uh, we also require at least a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution. And then again, you need to be currently working part-time or full-time in an area in strategic enrollment management, preferably. Um, we do ask for a one-page resume so that we can verify career experience and uh, education background. Um, and then everyone starts by completing a short online admission application, which is then reviewed by um, our admission committee uh, here at ACRO. In terms of the curriculum and recognition, so there's four curricular uh, components to SEMEP. And I'll be going over each of the four of these. And then the recognition is your name gets added to an online registry, and then you also get a formal printed certificate in recognition of the endorsement. So in terms of the curriculum, uh, most people start with the Essentials of STEM course, depending on when they join the program. That's one thing I should mention. The program, you can join any day of the year. Um, so we don't have enrollment periods. Uh, we accept learners all 365 days of the year. So it is flexible from a starting standpoint. 
Um, but many people like to enroll uh, and start with the Essentials of STEM course. It's typically offered, the next one will start in September, uh, and then we offer it again in February. Um, and anybody who's already completed this course will, uh, uh, within the last three years can roll this into the STEM EP curriculum and have that count. Uh, but again, it's four weeks. Uh, it's the most formal uh, structured part of the program, the only really structured part in terms of the time commitment. It is a designated four-week period. And I'll talk a little bit uh, in just a minute about the time commitment for that each week. Um, the second component are our online webinars. Uh, we do require um, all learners to watch and write up three of our webinars. Two of them are required, uh, one about planning and the other one about you know, marketing and, and PR. And actually, I just realized we just changed this. So actually, the two required webinars are listed correctly on the website. My apologies for, for not updating this slide. Um, and then the third one is chosen from archived or upcoming webinars. And so that gives the learner the flexibility to customize their uh, their learning based on something that they that may interest them. Uh, plus, it keeps the content relevant if there's an upcoming webinar on a topic of interest. Um, for the third component, which uh, Stephen talked about, uh, his field visits. So uh, field visits can be accomplished in one of three ways. Option one is you do three traditional visits to three different colleges or universities. Option two is you, uh, instead of the third field visit, you can use an ACRO uh, annual meeting or the STEM conference or tech and transfer conference. Um, and write up the sessions that you go to there. And the third option would be to do two traditional field visits, but the third one is a virtual visit. And this is for people that might live in remote areas or who did not have funding from their institution to cover travel costs. Um, the virtual option uh, is not as ideal as an in-person visit, but it is an opportunity um, if that's what's needed for a learner. So those are the three options available with the field visits. Um, for the in-person visits, they're all a at least a six-hour visit, um, and again, the learner gets to select the site, um, and we can provide guidance uh, at ACRO if, if needed. Um, but two hours are required in admissions, two hours in registrar, two hours in an area of enrollment management, and we do strongly encourage financial aid because with cost and affordability playing such a big factor in enrollment these days, uh, again, that's encouraged but not required. Um, it also depends on who might be available at that institution the day that you're visiting. So we recognize that. Um, and I should say that each of the field visits then are written up in a formal report, just like the webinars are written up in a formal report. And I should mention, too, that most of the learners, when they share feedback about SEMEP, uh, the field visits are the richest part of their experience and the part that they seem to really gain a lot of insight and perspective because you're seeing an enrollment management operation in action and learning first and foremost from people who are doing that work. Um, sometimes people pick emerging enrollment management operations. Some people pick you know, established enrollment management models and operations. It just depends on where the institution is at. For the capstone, we also have three options for the capstone. Uh, the most popular one is to do a research study, which I'll talk about here in just a second. The second option is to do a literature review within enrollment management. And the third option is to do a customized enrollment project, which is where many people will write an enrollment plan with this option. And that was um, Stephen's example as well. What most learners like about the capstone is they usually do something that they're trying to accomplish at work. So then they can, they can accomplish and kill kind of two birds with one stone because whatever they're doing for their capstone, uh, they try to apply at their institution or share with their institution, maybe have their institution adopt. Um, and so it's a great way to actually get something done at work is uh, by being enrolled in this uh, program and doing the capstone. For the research study, um, participants and learners can choose either a retention study or a prospective new student study. So depending on maybe what their interest is or what the institution needs. Uh, but again, looking at a population size of at least 100 and then dividing them into a control group and experimental group to determine if your actions you know, make a difference for what you're trying to study. Um, and then we require that, again, you choose your outreach medium and a message um, 
and then you, again, begin measuring the differences in actions that are taken. And then all of our capstones do re require a peer review where you seek feedback from a colleague and then incorporate their feedback into your final submission. Um, and we can connect you to uh, people who are enrolled in SEMI-P, but it doesn't have to be somebody who's in our program. The second option for the literature review is you select a primary text and determine the foundational message. Uh, most people will select a text published by ACRO, but that's not required. Um, and then you research three additional STEM articles and complete an annotated bibliography. And again, also complete the peer review. Um, this is probably the least popular of the capstones, uh, primarily, I think, because people are interested in, again, writing a plan or completing research uh, for their institution. And this one also requires the articulation of some career goals um, as people are thinking about it in the future. The third option, again, this is a custom research option, which is growing in popularity. Um, this one requires an abstract and an outline uh, with approval from, uh, from me as the director to make sure that it's comprehensive enough as a capstone to meet the requirement. Um, and again, it also requires, um, you know, a peer review. Oftentimes, if people are in writing an enrollment plan, it's going to be much longer than the eight to ten pages for most of the capstones. But again, um, you know, we don't kind of look, we don't frown upon exceeding that because most enrollment plans um, are going to be, you know, if they're pretty comprehensive, are going to be larger than eight to ten pages. But many of them can be done in eight to ten pages. Um, and the capstone also requires, this, the enrollment plan or project requires an institutional profile. And so here's some examples of some recent capstone titles uh, for some of our graduates besides what, you know, Stephen had shared. So somebody did a plan, managing for outcomes, uh, looking specifically at their institution about STEM, and then another one focused on student success. But again, you know, I, I think for all of our graduates, we've all had different capstone uh, subjects and topics. Um, and again, that's the richness of the, of the program. You know, so some people always ask, you know, why should I do uh, the endorsement? And part of it, it all comes down to career capital, right? It's a formal recognition of your skill set in the field, positions you as a field, uh, in the field as a leader. Um, it can assist with career advancement. Many of our graduates uh, typically have gotten promoted uh, and have leveraged the endorsement, you know, for a promotion, and it becomes something that distinguishes them from other candidates. Um, because, again, there's just so few people that have an EM credential. Lots of years of experience, but because the field was relatively new in terms of formal education, um, you know, there's only, I, I would say there's, you know, less than 100 people in the country that have some form of uh, an enrollment management credential. So here's how the time breaks down. Uh, the program is designed to be completed in 12 to 18 months, uh, which is very reasonable. Um, the essentials of STEM is the largest component because that's about eight hours a week for four weeks um, in terms of the content and the online discussions. Um, so that one, again, you do have to make sure you dedicate the time to. You transition into the webinars, that's about 10 hours. That's the lowest amount of commitment in terms of watching and writing up the reports. The field visits is, is really, you know, equal to the essentials of STEM. Um, and obviously, you have the flexibility of spreading your field visits out and writing up the reports. But again, that's about 30 hours. And then the capstone, we estimate that all three options require the same investment of time, about 20 hours. Um, you know, give or take. Obviously, if you're writing an enrollment plan, you might not be the only person working on it, but you do need to be the primary author. And you may be doing a lot of uh, data gathering uh, on top of that, you know, 20 hours in order to, to write the plan. So again, it's about 90, just over 90 hours of time spread over 12 to 18 months. And when people enroll in the program, I kind of give them a, a timeline for how they can break all, of, they can chunk all of these out over the 12 to 18 months. Most people, I will say, are taking the 18 months versus the 12 months. But we do, we have had uh, individuals who have completed in, in, in 12 months because they're committed to getting it done. Um, want to want to move on. In terms of the cost of the program, uh, for those People who are members of ACRO, the tuition is $17.99. Uh, it's been the same price for the last six years. Um, that does include the tuition for the Essentials of STEM online course. So if you've already taken that, you can deduct the almost $500 for that. For those of you who are not uh, 
members of ACRO, the cost is $2,099, so an additional $300. The other cost you would just need to figure out about incorporating would be if you're planning to go to the ACRO conference or STEM conference for the optional field visits, and then expenses for the field visits, which would include transportation, hotel, and meals, depending if you're going to institutions near you or not so close. A lot of people will do a field visit connected to an ACRO conference, so, you know, for example, people who might be going to the STEM conference in Washington, D.C. in November might try to find an institution in D.C. so that they can do the conference and then complete one field visit. That's obviously going to save some transportation costs, especially if they're not from the East Coast. In terms of evaluating um, the submission of materials, so the work is reviewed by our team here at ACRO. Uh, which includes uh, Stephen. He's one of uh, four kind of adjunct evaluators that we uh, that we rely on, and we offer feedback with each assignment. There's no grading, uh, but we do request revision sometimes if we feel like the first submission does not hit um, all of the uh, items that we're seeking. Uh, and, and again, we use a formal feedback form to offer that feedback. Um, and again, um, as I mentioned, the the, the capstone is reviewed by um, peers uh, in the field. In terms of program support, uh, we do offer monthly online chats um, so that we can answer questions. We have done a SEMEP meet and greet at the annual STEM conference, so we bring together learners and graduates there as we grow in the number of graduates. Uh, we do offer field visit assistance, so if you need some help generating some site visits, uh, with our connections, we can make that outreach with you. Um, we can provide guidance on the capstone. Um, and we do uh, sometimes select capstones to be published. And so this is also an opportunity to get published um, you know, if we believe your research study uh, is pretty significant and of value to our members, then uh, we've had several of our graduates who've been published. And then you become, you know, part of a pool that gets invited to present and write and serve on committees because um, again, we see you as somebody having this endorsement. We want to capitalize on your knowledge and, and expertise within the field. Once you uh, finish the program, uh, then you become a part of the National Registry. Many people will also add uh, their endorsement to their LinkedIn profile and can link to uh, their recognition with ACRO. Uh, here's an example of Stephen. Uh, profile on the on the registry, um, and so again, uh, we list uh, and describe his capstone, uh, what year he graduated, and what his current role is. And we have had an increase in people from the field of financial aid who are uh, uh, participating in our program, um, as well as people from admissions, registrar, and uh, enrollment management. And then this is uh, uh, what the uh, certificate looks like uh, once you become endorsed, and that'll get sent out to you in the mail. So, and here's just one other comment from one of our graduates um, uh, from last year who had a great experience and uh, wanted to, to pass on this this comment. So, at this point, uh, we'll open it up for questions that you might have about the program. Um, which I see Susan posed one question. Can you watch the webinars prior to taking the Essentials of STEM? Um, yes, you can. There's no specific order other than the capstone is last. Um, the feedback, though, I get is that people say once they, they prefer, they benefited greatly when they participated in the Essentials course first. But that does not preclude you from watching some of the webinars and writing them up or even doing a field visit. Um, I just think the Essentials really provides a solid foundation for the rest of the curriculum. But again, required but not, um, you know, um, or encouraged but not required um, if, if you want to do that in, you know, in sequence. So other questions for either Stephen as one of our learners and one of our evaluators or questions um, for myself. Looks like we've got some questions coming in here from Maureen and Megan. So thanks for, for posing those so that others can learn. Um, I should mention, too, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, right now we do not have a cap on enrollment. Uh, we do have about 40 uh, current learners. Um, and we have about 20, uh, just over 20 people that have graduated with the uh, endorsement. All right. In general, do you find institutions pay for this program? 
Um, yes, they do. I would say majority of the institutions pay for it. I think how many people justify it is, is completing the program is roughly about the same cost as going to a conference with ACRO, and so I think some people will often take the conference year off um, to enroll in the program and use that as part of their professional development, and you know, I think it's much more substantial than going to the conference because the capstone's required, um, and again, you do produce something that your institution um, can use. The other thing, Maureen, that we're exploring, but I can't make any announcement yet, but we're looking at establishing a partial scholarship um, but I'm not sure when that's going to roll out. We're working on figuring out how that's going to be funded. Um, but uh, that may be something that may be available sometime in, in 2019. But currently, right now, um, you know, everybody does have to pay um, for the program, you know, as you're being admitted to the program. Uh, and again, many institutions, most institutions are, are covering the cost as part of professional development. Teresa, thank you for your questions. For the site visits, what's the length and format um, for those reports? The conference debrief is two to three pages. Um, the, you know, the site visit uh, reports are roughly two to three pages, um, typically single-spaced. Um, usually that pr that's enough to provide the essence um, of it. I would recommend, you know, my biggest tip for anybody in the program is write up the field visits within 24 hours because even though you took, you might be a great note taker, trying to capture the essence and process it through in terms of how, what you learned and how it relates to your institution, it's best if you do it, um, you know, immediately. So the, in total, you know, the site visit report, uh, you know, will be from six to nine pages when you do all three visits or if you include the conference. Um, in terms of that. All right, next question. Do you have resources available to help encourage or justify um, the endorsement? I'm thinking of a form, form letter style um, resource. Megan, that's a great question, and uh, it's actually been something that's been on my list, so I actually will follow up with you um, separately, and I'll let you be our guinea pig on putting something together. Um, that we can do for that because we have that model at ACRO for the ACRO conference if you're looking to justify going to the conference. So I think we can do a variation um, on that. So thanks for raising that. And that probably will be something eventually we'll add to the website that people could download and then customize and give to their supervisor as a way to request institutional funding um, for that. Uh, the other question uh, that Eric posed, uh, boy, you guys are on point with your questions. It's like you're reading our minds here. Is there a discount for the STEM or ACRO conference for those in the endorsement program? Again, I can't make a formal announcement right now, but I am suspecting that we might be offering a discount for SEMI-P learners um, for this fall's STEM conference. Most likely it will only be extended for the STEM conference since the SEM endorsement is um, so connected to the SEM conference. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, I can't make a formal announcement yet, but I'm anticipating that we will be doing that as a pilot for this fall um, as a way to encourage the SEM EP learners to participate in the SEM conference because, again, there's so much overlap between, uh, between the two. Plus, you can use the conference as one of your field visits. Um, Robert's question, having already had an article in uh, published, can such research be built upon for the capstone? Um, we could probably explore that. Um, I would need to review um, your article or anybody else's article that they might want to expand upon and then look at an outline of what you would be building off of. But certainly um, that could be considered for that enrollment project capstone option number three. Um, absolutely, we could look into that. Um, in terms of are there limitations to the site visit, perhaps cost savings for us would be attending sites nearby to our institution. Uh, yeah, great question, Maureen. Uh, I mean, there are, no, there are no limitations to the site visit. We try to make that so that you get the best from it. Some people always ask, well, how do I choose the site visits? You know, I always recommend it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking at uh, you can look at aspirational schools um, that you want to become like, right? So then you can learn a little bit more about how they're doing enrollment management. 
Um, it's hard to do competitors for obvious reasons, um, but you could do peer institutions, um, and we could help you locate who your peers are. If you don't know better, you could contact your institutional research office for a list of peers. Um, again, you might just say, we want to do schools within our state or within our region. Um, that obviously helps for convenience as well as travel costs. So I think it just depends what you're looking to get out of the, the field visits in terms of what you're seeking to learn. And again, we can always have a conversation, and I've made suggestions before, you know, for institutions. Um, some people will do, you know, like institutions in other states. Um, so they try to find an institution. And, you know, you heard um, Stephen talked about doing, you know, uh, the CUNY system um, to kind of compare to another type of um, system. So that worked out well for him. And that was, I don't want to say an exception for him to do a system office, but again, um, you know, that was something that we approved because it fit um, the role that he played um, in the work that he was doing. So. Christopher, one, one other thing I'd like to add to that is, is coming up with the institutions was actually one of the more challenging parts of the program, believe it or not. Um, I, it, my best advice would be to prepare a list of more than three um, because I did come across, I mean, and this is just me, I did come across an institution that had said no because they were too busy. Um, I came across an institution that just failed to reply uh, after getting poked a couple of times. Um, and, you know, my original intent was to go through and do, you know, a, a public two-year, a public four-year, and a private four-year, um, and that just didn't pan out. And you saw, you know, I kind of gave examples of where I landed uh, as far as my field visit. So, like I said, my best advice would be to prepare, you know, a short list of more than three um, so you have some backups ready. Great advice, Stephen. Thanks for, for chiming in. Um, Eric had a question about their extra book cost for the program. Um, we do not use uh, a specific text um, for the program, and so there are no uh, book costs. Um, any uh, literature that's provided through the essentials course is all provided digitally, and so you will have to read quite a few uh, STEM articles um, through the essentials course. Um, and we do provide a list of recommended reading on the SEMEP website. The one that I always recommend is the Handbook of SEM, um, which was a joint publication with, um, with ACRO. Um, but we right now have not integrated. That book was uh, published after we launched the curriculum. And so Kimberly, who's our assistant director, and I have had conversations about how to incorporate a text um, into the curriculum. But right now um, we rely on you know, the webinars as well as um, the essentials uh, readings that are done, which are really, um, you know, pretty comprehensive. Great question. Thank you very much. That is a very worthwhile textbook, by the way. Which one, the Handbook of STEM? Yeah, the Handbook is a, is a very good book. Yeah, it's very comprehensive. The challenge with thinking about incorporating into the curriculum is we're very sensitive. Enrollment management folks are very busy to begin with, and we don't want to add a fifth curricular component. And, you know, that book has, I don't know, like 60-some chapters, I think. And so it is, it is lengthy, around, but it is filled with a yeah. lot. <laughs> we, we've tossed around maybe extracting some chapters and maybe pulling out one webinar for that, but we haven't done so yet. Uh, but it is a rich resource and one that I should be on every enrollment manager's uh, shelf because it covers a lot of uh, different topics. So, All right. Any other questions that you might have um, for us? And I'm going to just put up on the slide here that if you do want to contact um, myself or Stephen, because um, you do uh, have follow-up questions, um, you can contact us at the email addresses um, there. Uh, we're more than happy to, um, to answer questions. We also have an online inquiry form on the SEMEP um, website through ACRO, um, plus all of this information that we covered is available um, there. We also provide, I should mention that we do have a, uh, some resources, so when you get ready to contact your host um, sites for the field visits. We do have a, a form and a document that you can send to them about how they should best prepare for your visit um, so that you can accomplish everything that you need to in terms of being there for the six hours. Um, so, um, And yes, Maureen, we will provide this um, slideshow um, uh, with 
the um, I'll make sure that um, Syra, who will be sending out the, the recording, I'll make sure that she sends out the slide um, to this as well so that you have access to those. Oh, actually, Michael just, of course, provided them right there in the link. So go ahead and click on that and download it, and you can save the slide deck um, for there. And then we, Kimberly and or I, will be at the SEM conference um, in November. Uh, which is November 11th through the 14th in Washington, D.C. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Um, for anybody who's, uh, you know, a current learner or a graduate or even a prospective student, we'll have a SEM-EP meet and greet um, right before the conference starts um, at the conference site. Um, so hopefully that's a place where we can all connect as well. So I'm going to make one final call for questions before we go ahead and conclude. I want to thank you for joining us today uh, and hearing from Stephen about his perspective with the program and, and learning about the nuts and bolts of uh, the endorsement. So um, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thanks, everyone.